Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to AMSA's webinar titled The Role of Foreign Consulates in Protecting Migrant Workers. My name is Bahar Tahari, Project Consultant with AMSA, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar today. Also making sure that everything's running smoothly in this webinar are AMSA team members Nisrak Yakub, Nima Ejercito, and Boyd Hayes. Thank you for all of your support in today's webinar in the background. As a provincial umbrella association, AMSA acknowledges that BC is on the unceded homelands of First Nations who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We recognize the privilege that we have as settlers on this land and acknowledge that AMSA's operations is on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We would also like to thank the uh, Government of Canada's Temporary Foreign Worker Program for funding this event today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Hugo Velasquez. And Hugo, you can take it away. Welcome. Here thank you. Go. Thank you, Bahar. And thank you, AMSA, for this, uh, for this invitation and for Consul General Berenice de Ceballos to kindly agree to present with me today. So I also want to acknowledge that Mosaic serves and protects refugees, immigrants, and migrant workers on the traditional and unceded Coast Salish territories, the ancestral lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Muskim, Kit-Kat, Tuasim, uh, Quitlam, Katsi, Semiyamu, and Maski Nations. So I wanna give a little bit of context of how this relationship between, uh, or this close relationship between the consulates and a nonprofit uh, settlement agency started. So it all began in 2017, 2018, when I was originally not part of Mosaic, I was part of the consulate and the consul general and myself, uh, we were receiving a very high volume of uh, complaints of abuses in basically in the agricultural sector, although we know that this goes on in every sector. And just to give you a little bit of the overview, there were over 70% of migrant workers in housing that was substandard. And by substandard, uh, to be clear, we don't mean the standard of the Consulate of Mexico. It was the standard of the BCAC, British Columbia Agricultural Council housing guidelines. So those were not being followed by 70% of the employers. And um, because of the seasonal agricultural workers program, the consulate has the right to make unannounced visits to the farms. And this is how we started discovering what was happening. And of course, because of the complaints of the workers and also nonprofit organizations that would reach out to us. So the, result, uh, the volume of Complaints also included bullying and harassment from the employers to the migrant workers. Uh, like I said, it was mainly agriculture, although we also have cases in construction, caregiving, and hospitality. There was a lack of support and information regarding how to ask, access the health system. This still continues to date in many aspects. Uh, there was a lack of access to exercise any type of right in their own language. So we were often told that migrant workers have the same rights as Canadians, which is true, but it's also true that they do not have the same access or freedom to access them as Canadians. And that makes a very big difference. So uh, inadequate or inexistent coordination among authorities, agencies, or any institution employing or servicing migrant workers, uh, we realized that uh, authorities and people in general, everybody involved in protecting or servicing a migrant worker was not talking to each other. Many times we didn't even know each other and we didn't know who to call. And there needed to be an update in all related policies. And this uh, would include the federal government and at the BC level, uh, the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Health because housing is uh, in the portfolio of Minister Adrian Dix, Minister of Health. Uh, the human, the bullying and harassment and safety, Minister uh, Baines, Minister of uh, Labor, 
and also you know the all related to the industry because there were workers mainly from the agriculture sector minister popham so there was a call for action um mainly what it what would what triggered this action was all the complaints the diplomatic notes that were sent and also that it made the front page of the New York Times. Uh, uh, it was a situation of Mexican workers in, I believe, Coston, and the conditions that they were in, and that was in the front page of the New York Times. So all authorities said, uh, it's time to sit down and talk. So we held emergency meetings with the federal, provincial, and municipal authorities. Um, there was an action uh, action group created in the province where deputy ministers of deputy minister Hughes, deputy minister uh, Shoemaker, and I don't remember, and um, the director general of Ministry of Health would meet because it involved the three the all three ministries, and they were also now meeting with the federal government. So we created support teams to address emergencies. And um, we were also uh, given a voice to participate and, and address policy issues. So how did this work out? So, um, two of the director generals of uh, ESDC visited BC and had conversations with the consulate, had conversations with the government and with nonprofit uh, organizations. And they, they decided to create something unique to Canada, which was a grassroots um, bottom to up approach to fix what was being done. So they went directly to the workers, directly to the settlement agencies and asked what was going on. And then they started working with policymakers and uh, receiving also the opinion of the consulates to try to address each, each, uh, each issue important thing and I think the main the most important thing is that we were all invited to those meetings and you would see everyone in the same room basically the meetings were at mosaic where the plenary which included everyone uh, foreign governments didn't have a right to vote but did have a right to voice and uh, we would all connect and there we would also uh, to my opinion destroy many of the myths that are that go around, you know, that diplomats just come here to have a fun time and they don't work. I personally work 24 seven, the consul general work 20, works 24 seven because we were protection officers and that's what the Mexican law says and that's what we were here to do. So I would tell you, this is the first summer in nine years that I don't have a call every five minutes, including Saturdays and Sundays from 5, p 5 a.m. onwards. So that's the basically the life of a protection officer and the consulate. So we didn't really appreciate when we were told, hey, you guys don't do anything, you don't work. And I think the main thing was, what do we have to do? Who is who's, Who has the mandate to do what? And that was not uh, understood. And I would say, no, sometimes we didn't even understand uh, ourselves. Uh, related to all the authorities and who was in charge of this part of housing, who was in charge of this part of health. And basically that plenary fixed that because at least we could change cards and everybody could talk to each other. So I have had a problem with MSP. I could call the director of MSP. And if somebody had a problem with the consulate, they would call us. But then we say, hey, we can't do everything. We're only our mandate. And I think consul general will talk about that. Our mandate is a very strict mandate, and actually we're doing more than what we have to do just to keep the program alive and protect the workers. But all those lines were crossed all the time, and they, these kind of meetings and programs and discussing policies directly in a room with everyone involved, is uh, it was very healthy and uh, very productive, I would say, and I think we should do it again now that uh, COVID restrictions are lower and that we can meet. It would be very important. At the same time, it gave uh, diplomats the opportunity to meet and to understand that we had the same complaints and the same needs, and we needed a common voice. So coordinated by Mexico, by the Consul General, we created the Consular Alliance for the Protection of Migrant Workers. So this is a non-official, non-binding, relaxed, uh, but very active, 
uh, group of diplomats that were tired of having their nationals being abused. And we started sharing confidential information regarding uh, abusive employers to prevent other, other, other nationals from being abused. So usually what would happen is Mexico would ban a farm from receiving Mexicans, and then they would go to Guatemala, or they go to Guatemala, or Jamaica, or uh, Philippines. And um, what we started to do is, you know, uh, share that information, you know, be aware here, look what's happening. And even um, when that employer would seek out to Jamaica or to Guatemala or to the Philippines, they already had a report or a copy of the report of Mexico and they, they could assess the situation in a different manner. So uh, at the same time, the federal, of, uh, federal government of Canada provided funds uh, to create the BC Community Capacity Building Project which at the moment includes 22 agencies. And this is a, also a very unique within settlement uh, uh, program because being a settlement agency, Mosaic receives funds and at the same time, we give them out to those 22 agencies. We have our own migrant worker program and we do our own outreach, but at the same time, we sign MOUs with 22 agencies that have different uh, different ways to reach out and help the workers. And they also have different outputs and objectives and we finance those. And we also work with employers. We are we finance WALI, the Western Alliance Labor Initiative with one of their uh, apps for migrant workers. So um, the service delivery, we include migrant workers hub, outreach services, forums, resource fairs, newsletters, and the redistribution of funds, right? 22 collaborating agencies, we build connections uh, like with sister, sister agencies like AMSA, right? Like success, trying all, all of us to work together to, to meet the needs of the workers and sharing best practices and addressing challenges, which is what we're doing today. And just, uh, and then we're happy to announce that this is gonna continue for 18 more months. Uh, we still don't know the amount that we were, will be allocated and to whom, but it, it will be continuing. So together with 22 agencies uh, at the end of fiscal December, fiscal three, December, 2021, we still are working on the final numbers right now for the end of fiscal in March, but we have been able to service directly 82,921 workers and counting. But we understand that this is not enough and settlement agents will always uh, have reduced capacity and we have to be strategic. What I tell my, my team is we do change lives. We go one at a time, but the important thing is to record this data and with our connection to consulates and to governments, we have to reach out to policymakers and say, hey, this is affecting in this type, this way, the life of the workers. We have the data, we have studied the policies and we wanna work with you to change those policies, which we think is the best approach to actually change millions of lives or thousands of lives, not only the ones that we reach that reach out to us that are just as important. So yeah, some of the success stories of the, B, of the Counselor Alliance, We've been sharing information to, to protect migrant workers. I can also say that the Ministry of Labor reached out to the, to the Consular Alliance before issuing the Temporary Foreign Worker Protection Act. And this is the only law I've seen that has a section that talks about receiving evidence from a foreign office as valid evidence of abuse in a case. So this is very important. Also, the Unity of the Consular Alliance was uh, one of the things that uh, made possible that the workers were, were when COVID, uh, when COVID was here, I mean, when the outbreak is still here, but with the outbreak, that they were received at YVR in hotels. So this is the only uh, province that received them for 14 days in a hotel which included room service, uh, having their clothes washed once a week, three meals, uh, health services. And I think this is the best example of how 
we all work together. There was uh, settlement agencies uh, assisting the workers in health. There were settlement agencies assisting the workers in and having walks every day uh, in healthcare and mental health. At the same time, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health was providing nurses there. Um, the Ministry of Agriculture was checking if they were the farms before they arrived to see if they were in the right, uh, if they, they were complying with the policies. So, I think this was a complete success and thank you because we did not lose one single worker to COVID. And that's that's something we should all be proud of. So, and this was not an immediate action. This was the product of years of speaking to each other, of sometimes yelling to each other and being in the same room and accepting <clears throat> what the other people do. So I can clearly say I've, met a lot of public servants from Canada that are very devoted and want some change, as well as uh, settlement workers and the, <laughs> and frontliners from every realm that really want to change the situation. So those are the ones that we have to get together and make changes. So this also helped uh, very much for immediate em emergency responses. I'll give you an example, BC floods. Uh, settlement agencies, we have some some funds for emergencies, and we were all over the place trying to look for them and work with them and, and have them. So the the what helped us a lot was not only the boots on the ground from every settlement agency that was helping the workers in their own community, especially in the Fraser Valley, but also the connection with uh, with the consulates because the information that was coming from settlement agencies. Was then collab uh, was then reconciled with the information and the list of names that each consulate had, uh, especially in Mexico, of the workers. So at one given time, when ESTC asked us, you know, what is your report on what's happening, we could give them a solid number of 150 workers, and we had their names, their last names, their phone numbers, where they were. Nobody was in harm's way, and everybody was at least in a shelter. And from there, then we can start uh, creating the emergency supports tailor made for those. Many agencies said that there were more, probably there were more and in, in more industries, but uh, it's also good to have a hard number that you can really uh, project and uh, back up. And that was what we came with 150 from different nationalities, both name, last name, and where they were in, in a matter of 24 hours. So if we stop stereotyping each other and we can make those phone calls and everybody offer what they can do best, I think this is the result. Uh, this also took Mosaic to reach out, uh, especially to, to the firefighters. And we also made connection with them, which are, uh, we started this from the consulate also. They're very proactive and uh, once they, found out the number of migrant workers that were there in communities, the fire chiefs immediately said nobody's going to die because of housing issues in our in our uh, community. Of course, there's a very specific mandate as to what they can inspect when they go to a house. And that's a problem in BC because there's no provincial inspections of housing by the, by the Ministry of, of Health. And because of that, uh, this week, we finally became part of the Integrated Disaster Council of BC. And then there I would be also 24-7 uh, trying to help with uh, any migrant worker that is in harm's way. At the moment, we are looking at 58 fires and uh, probably workers in Karameas that can uh, require help. So this is a little bit of what we did during the floods. We went out to the farms to where, where it was safe. In other places, we, we gathered in uh, churches, mainly in Abbotsford, St. Mary's and St. Mary Ann's Church. You know, the churches are also very strategic allies in this because they have a lot of confidence from the migrant workers. Sometimes they don't trust authorities. They don't trust the employer. They don't trust uh, the consulates. Uh, some trust some settlement agencies, but I think everybody trusts God and most of them uh, don't mind really uh, getting help from the churches. 
So some of the churches were very helpful in this sense. So after the BC floods, one of the problems we we encountered, and this was also in connection with the with the consulates, the, uh, the consulates have some money for protection, but they cannot give money to every worker that is in distress. I would say, you know, Mexico has around 6,000 SOP workers and 3,000 ag streams. There's no, no budget that can handle uh, helping out 10,000 workers in an emergency. And it is, they're in Canada and they're supposed to be helped in Canada by authorities, both provincial and um, federal. But there's some gaps and you, most of you that are in settlement agents, you know, we cannot go beyond our contract. And their contract is very specific as to where and why you can uh, use money. And we found our hands tied when uh, the BC floods and we had those 150 workers not having enough support to be able to, uh, to make the EI process faster. Uh, to be fair to the employers, the employers were trying to save their farms, had no time to give them their ROE, had no time to sit down with them in a computer that was going to be in English to help them with their EI. Some of them didn't have enough hours to be eligible for EI, and this was just not acceptable because, you know, not having income for two weeks and not sending money back home for a migrant worker is the end of its uh, fa family economy. So we reached out to the Clock Foundation, which is a union, and we said, we need funds immediately without any red tape. Just, uh, we need to give money to the workers and help them in these emergency cases. And they did, they, they provided 50K immediately, another 50K that might be coming uh, next month. And um, it's a one-on-one -on -one basis and it's for emergency. So they were very clear that they wanna do advocacy by donation. What does this mean? That they, they wanted uh, both the BC government and the federal government to know that they were not gonna cover their gaps uh, forever. And that uh, there was also has to be, you know, this is just to help not to subsidize the life of the workers because that's also impossible. So we, we made some rules and it's uh, basically 500 for wage loss. $500 max and $500 for other types of emergency. Usually the gaps include they cannot pay their rent. Uh, they're in an emergency situation and evacuation and they have nowhere to live. Dental is a, a must, uh, I would say. And uh, some have some um, family and they have issues with their children or don't have a job and have an emergency situation. And the only uh, requisite is to prove that you're a migrant worker, regardless of your immigration status. You can also be undocumented. And um, the money is only given directly to the workers through a wire transfer. And the only exception we've made was with a Salvation Army in case it's a victim of human trafficking, we would give that, we don't need to know their identity for their security. And that money would go do or goes directly to Salvation Army and Salvation Army will give it to that person in the safe house, which is happening. I mean, we don't have that case, but people trafficking is a fact. We've, uh, regarding this, both BC authorities and the government of Canada have shown interest. So all the data collected, uh, and this is uh, workers from every industry, and a lot of nationalities. So we have that hard data and we're at the end of uh, August, we will uh, send it to Minister Qualtro and to Minister Baines for their perusal and see how we can work together on having a, a permanent fund. So with our relationship with the Consulate of Mexico, and many of you can say, well, Hugo, because you know uh, you work there and that's why it's so easy to make this connection. I don't think so. I think that the connections, um, we're all, we all have a same, a same purpose, which is to help the migrant workers. And I'm at Mosaic because the consulate had a very good relationship with Mosaic. And, um, and I, the same thing with the YMCA and with options and with St. Mary Ann's uh, uh, church. So these are relationships that are ongoing and that we can foster and that we can make bigger. But the most important thing is to understand what legally does a consulate can and will do 
what they cannot, what a settlement agent can do, and what each authority is supposed to do also within their mandate. If we have this very clear, then we forget about, hey, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, and you're just concentrating, oh, that agency can do this, the consulate can do that, and the only thing pending is this, and that's where I'm going to put my effort. And um, this relationship has worked very well. So we decided to elevate it in a pilot program uh, proposed by Mexico to Mosaic, which I think is probably unique to Canada, but I, uh, we don't have all that information, but I would say uh, at least unique to BC, uh, unless anybody else send, uh, less tells us of another experience, because we have a permanent presence of a settlement agency and a foreign representation. Two members of my staff are at the consulate uh, once a week serving newcomers. And this is, includes migrant workers and other newcomers because Mosaic has uh, other services also. And it includes financial advice, settlement ad advice, virtual presentations, you know, for mothers that cannot be there and are working long hours or fathers and they wanna learn Spanish or wanna learn how to open an account or how to sell in Canada, we do those virtual presentations. Uh, coming up will be visit to farms we will reach out with the consulate to visit farms and provide our services to the workers. And I would say, and this is a uh, data provided by the consulate of Mexico as of last week with the common media campaign. And I would say mainly through of the consulate, 30,759 people have um, had this information and are reaching out. And basically, I know from uh, my colleague in the consulate, Alejandra, that uh, all the all the all the appointments are full. So we have, I think, uh, one or two months already fully booked, and it's it's working perfectly. And it's uh, also making Mosaic think because we have many other services, and <laughs> Carolina and Juan who are there are actually referring a lot of people to other of our programs that are beyond migrant workers. So this is a perfect example of understanding that uh, the consulates do protection, that we do settlement, that we need each other. And there's, uh, there's a lot to do and no reason to point fingers, but just to see what who can do what. So we also think um, that this is Actually, the MOU is funded by by the uh, uh, Consulate of Mexico, and the rest of our programs are funded by the government of Canada, except the CLAC fund, which is funded by the CLAC Foundation. And of course, I can't do this without my incredible team. Uh, there's Juan, Guri, Carolina, Abby, Celeste, uh, Jennifer, and Gurley. And uh, it's a mighty team, which we try to serve and connect with all of BC through our collaboration with the agencies and our own reach out. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Hugo. Um, I think we learned a lot about the process and how Mosaic connects with different consulates and all the work that you're doing in the background to protect migrant workers. Um, we will ask the audience to please post your questions in the in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Um, we will hear from our next speaker and then we'll have a Q&A session. So I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Berenice Diaz Ceballos, who is the Consul General of Mexico in Vancouver. Welcome, Berenice. Thank you very much, Bahar. And first of all, let me thank you for organizing this, uh, this very important meeting. I feel that we need to have these kinds of dialogue uh, frequently with many people, no? Because uh, there are a lot of uh, temporary workers here here in BC. At least I can just speak uh, for BC since I'm here, the Consul General. But really, thank you. I want to thank AMSA for uh, organizing this session because I think it's uh, very important. My presentation, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, then we will talk about the program requirements, the contract features, the consulate assessment and main initiatives that we have been doing since 2016, and the main challenges. First, I need to, to acknowledge that uh, I have been here for six years. It has been very interesting for me uh, to learn about, about SOP and how it has evolved. I can tell you that uh, I 
have a very good team. Uh, Hugo was with me for almost five years and we did a lot of, of great things. I need to recognize that if I know somebody really knows the program from the inside out is Hugo. Many of the information that I will present you, it was done by Hugo, by Ramon, by the team that we have here in the consulate and that it is, it is unique. Uh, well, the program started uh, in the middle of the 1960s. There was a recognition of the lack of domestic workers to fill the need of farms. In 1966, Seasonal Agriculture Workers Program is launched in, in Ontario. It began as a partnership between Canada and Jamaica and has since grown. Right now, there are many countries that are sending people to Canada uh, and here are the, the names. It's Mexico, Montserrat, San Kitts and Nevis, Santa Lucia, San Vincent and the Granadines, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, and Grenada. No? And also we know about other, other uh, countries like Guatemala and Salvador that they bring workers, but they don't, do not have a bilateral agreement with the government of Canada. Mexico joined the SOP in 1974 and started sending workers to BC in, 20, in, 24, in, in 2004. Uh, it's important, the program has been in place for almost uh, 18 years. Uh, when it was the 15th anniversary, we signed a declaration with the government of BC committing ourselves to look after the program, to supervise the program, and also to strengthen our, 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 our efforts in order to serve be, best the, the workers. In recent years, around 27,000 Mexican workers come to Canada annually under the SOP. 6,000 of them are here in BC. And well, I, I have to tell you and to share with you that in the recent uh, meeting that was held between the president of Mexico, the president of the United States and the premier of Canada, there is an agreement that Mexico will provide 50,000 workers to help Canada with its agriculture. And well, let me tell you that uh, Hugo has mentioned a lot that we have a, a, that uh, consulates, we have a mandate of protection. It's yes, this what I will talk about is directly of what we do with the migrant uh, agricultural workers. But you need to have also in mind uh, that the Consulate General of Mexico also deals with, in general, with the protection of all Mexican nationals that are here in DC. No? So, for example, if the, uh, a worker of the construction has a problem, the consulate has to intervene. Uh, uh, sadly, but uh, sometimes where, when workers or Mexican people pass away, we have to intervene and help the families. So it's a very broad sense, the, the, the protection that consulates give. And also sometimes the problem is that people do not understand what consulates are. Uh, for example, in the, con in the case of this consulate, uh, we do a lot of, uh, we provide services to our people. For example, I emit, um, uh, uh, I emit um, passports, visas, all different legal documents that my community needs here. Besi besides that, we have uh, this area of protection that include the temporary workers. Also, now I have the mandate to promote Mexico. That means that I, I need to enhance the economic, cultural, activities, innovation, cooperation with Canada. So we have, as you can see, a very broad mandate. And one very important part of that mandate is obviously the 6,000 workers that come every year to help Canada. This is done. I have a, a specific team dedicated just for the migrant workers. That uh, uh, is, uh, we, I have five people right now working there. And also, we are supported by uni universities. And that's very important by voluntary people that come from universities that help us to deal with all the issues that we, we need to help workers with. Going back uh, to, the, to the presentation, what I can tell you is that there is a contract you know, that every, every worker has to sign with the employer. And it's very interesting because sometimes the employer 
or the workers don't know exactly what the contract, the, the content of the contract is. And that has been a, really a challenge. You know? Sometimes we talk to the employers, they, they, they hire another office to give services or to, or to fulfill the, the, the documents for the workers, but the owners and the employers don't really know the content and the rights and uh, the rights and, and the things they have to comply with. Because as Hugo has mentioned several times, we are not asking anything different for our workers. The only thing that the consulate regularly does when we talk to authorities and, and everybody is we want the Canadian laws to be also applied to our workers that come here and are contributing enormously to the agricultural sector of Canada. So employers normally they hire temporary foreign workers when Canadians and permanent residents are not available. The activity must be related to on-farm primary agriculture and they need to provide adequate housing and meet all domestic labor regulations. From the side of the workers, uh, they need to, they need to uh, obviously have experience in farming, at least be minim, uh, have 18 years of age, be able to satisfy Canadi Canadian laws and laws of the home country, and from the part of the government, uh, well, the, through the national uh, employment system in Mexico that depends of the Ministry of Labor, not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which are the ones that, that well, the consulates, we depend on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but this program is supervised in Mexico by the, the national employment system that are the ones that are responsible to recruit and select the temporary foreign workers. They also make sure workers have the necessary documents. Normally, we maintain a pool of qualified workers, and also we coordinate with this national employment system to assist the workers in Canada. But also, it's important to have in mind that the main decisions of the program are not decisions of the consulates. It's not a personal decision of the of the consul or the people that is heading the post at that time. All the decisions regarding the program are taken or, or are suggested and, and given the instructions by the Ministry of Labor in Mexico. I'm, uh, I'm going to, to talk about the case of uh, British Columbia because it's uh, the jurisdiction I cover and also because we need to be aware and that's something that we have been talking with the, with the government that uh, as you know, many of the, the rules of the program, some are dealt at the federal Canadian level and the other ones are provincial. So we're insisting that uh, workers need a, a contract that should be a specific, a, a specified exactly for the, the region we are covering. In this case, the case of PC, if you take a look to the, to the contract, it's really difficult to understand because sometimes it says, these rules should apply, but uh, not in British Columbia. And th the contract is very confusing. The, that contract has been going, changing every year, almost every year. So it's difficult to understand. And now what we are working with authorities is this idea that we need to have a, a contract by province so uh, we can spell out and write out exactly what we think the, the workers need and not leave it uh, vague because there comes interpretation of employers that not necessarily always comply with the laws of Canada. So uh, what are the general rules? Well, the general rules is that workers can be here for maximum a period of eight months between January 1st and December 15th. After that date, they have to leave. The standard working day is eight hours. Parties may agree to extend hours. And obviously workers that are far away from their families and they know that they come here to work, normally want to work additional hours because in that way they can get additional income for their families. Regarding the logistics, eh, employers are responsible for, a, for the cost of a two-way effort land and land transportation. Regarding housing that has been, as eh, Hugo has mentioned, one of the greatest concerns that we have right now in the program, uh, the, the employer must provide accommodation that meets guidelines 
and the annual approval of a private license, license inspector. Uh, costs related to accommodation are paid by workers at the rate of $5.36 per working day, and it doesn't uh, ha, uh, cannot exceed $826 for the whole state. Regarding wages, taxes, and benefits, sub workers must be paid the minimum provincial hour wage that right now is $15.65. Workers must file an annual tax return. And I can tell you this question of the taxes is really a headache for the workers. Uh, later on, I will, will share some examples and what are the problems that uh, workers face in the uh, in the annual tax also workers make contributions and are entitled to receive paternity maternity benefits retirement disability pensions and so survivors and children's pensions as all canadians do regarding health a payroll deduction of private medical insurance premium is at a rate of one dollar point zero five cents per day and uh, well this is during the first three months when the workers arrive that they are not able or, or access uh, MSP and that's something we have been discussing with the authorities because they know that they are coming. We know that this situation is given to the refugees and we are trying to to sort out something that would be also a, in benefit of the temporary workers. Worker and an employer must report within 24 hours any serious accident and illness. And I think this, uh, believe me, it's very important. We have had very serious cases when, when workers are not taken to hospital and that threatens their life, their, 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 their health. And also because for workers, uh, they need to have assistance and translation. And that's something that we normally do from the consulate. If any worker is in the hospital, we have to be present in all the meetings with the doctors in order to make the translation to them and to, to share with them what, what the, the procedures are, what the doctors are thinking. And well, we have had a very serious cases. I will also talk later on a little bit about a case of one worker that was here in the hospital for two months, and then we have to send him a, back in a, in a medical ambul ambulance to Mexico and how we did it. And well, I, I skip telling you that work-related injuries, illness covered by government run and WorkSafe BC, we work very close together with, with all the governmental agencies in order to, to see the, the needs of the workers. So as Hugo was telling you, I think uh, uh, he and his team, when they were here in the consulate, they did a great job because they visited 350 farms out of 550 and that comp comprises 5,000 workers. It was very, you need to be uh, aware that uh, British Columbia has a very great, a very large territory. No, it's like uh, two times the, 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 the size of Mexico or even more. So it's not easy to visit all the, all the all the farms because of the lack of resources, a human and economic or financial ones. But well, these visits to these 350 farms were very important to have a, a, a complete idea of uh, what were the challenges of the prog pro program and where the problems were. What were our main findings? The question of non-compliant housing facilities was of 70%. So, this is very important, no? And I, I think since we were uh, the consulate and myself, we, I, I have been very uh, spoken out with authorities the, uh, about the concerns that we have in facilities. That was one of the main reasons that the authority here in BC took the decision that when temporary workers came during the, the COVID-19, the, the quarantine was made in hotels. Another uh, finding that we, we made was that there was frequent bullying and harassment to, to the workers. And that's a, a, a constant, sometimes a, a, it's a cultural issue that we need to change. And a, these people come to work. We have to respect them in all senses. Also, well, as I was mention, you, mentioning you, the health issues that are not attended and reported on time also that there were unauthorized transfer of workers or sometimes they, the workers are shared with other farms 
that's not in the contract. Um, farmers cannot do this without uh, telling the consulate and, and that we that we give the the, the authorization. <clears throat> also, there are a lot of errors in payment and, and deductions, and uh, this has created a negative uh, public opinion and also in the media. No, it's I think everybody and all the, the actors that are involved in this process, we need to be much more proactive to uh, not only talk about the problems of the program, but also of the successes. There are a lot of, of uh, success stories that we also need to share with the public and with the media, so re they really can appreciate and understand what the, the, the work of temporary workers are here in Canada. Well, as Hugo mentioned you, we have been working for six years with the authorities. It's uh, first we started uh, talking to the Ministry of Labor, to the Ministry of Health and the Minister of Agriculture, you now to try to, to have this small group that we could connect among us to discuss the, the problems. It has worked very good. I can uh, I can tell you that, and, and I need to make a recognition to Lana Popham. She's the Minister of Agriculture. And she has been really of great help, not only for the consulate of Mexico, but he has a, she, she is really concerned about the program and she normally help us to, to solve any kind of challenges that we're facing. Because it's important to, to, uh, to understand that, for example, in my case, I'm a, uh, I'm a career diplomat, but when I'm posted abroad, um, I have a diplomatic immunity, but this is regarding uh, the Vienna Convention, but we are obliged to comply with all, all laws in the country where we are sent. So it's not that the consulate can do whatever uh, we want. We want to be respectful, respectful of the laws and where we are working. So um, I, as an initiative and outcomes, well, we started with this little group uh, between the three ministries and uh, also the, the Consul General of Mexico. It has evolved having this consular alliance that is very important because the consular alliance, as Hugo was mentioning, it's not a formal group. So we don't have rules and procedures in that group, but we meet uh, regularly to talk about the challenges, the findings that we have. And also the consular alliance was created as Hugo was mentioning, for example, Jamaica, they don't have an office here in, in uh, Vancouver. Their office is in Kelowna. So if the girls uh, that work uh, for Jamaica go to a farm and they see that there are things that are not going well and that there are Mexicans, they call me so I can act. And we are trying to do that exercise with all the countries that are members of the Consular Alliance. I can mention you countries like Korea, con countries like Philippines, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Jamaica, and many other countries that participate in this informal group that was created by Mexico. And uh, well, the last uh, uh, country that joined our alliance was Solomon Island. They bring a small number of, of people to work here in, in BC, but they also find the same problems that, that normally we find. Uh, some of the things that also uh, that we find is uh, sorry let me let me go back uh, so there are a lot of things that uh, well the main findings I already covered them then some of the initiatives that we have taken taken is uh, this question of enhancing our relationships with stakeholders including government consulates with BCAC, that is the Association of, of Employers, and many NGOs. I think, uh, and this has been our experience, we, we learned a lot from the pandemic, no? because uh, it was difficult to reach out to, the, to all the workers. So we needed the support of the people that are on the ground. And in that sense, NGOs like Mosaic and other uh, options and YMCA, they are already on the ground and that they help us a lot. So it's really, as Hugo was mentioning, it's not only one person that can do any, everything for, for the workers, but we need to understand what are our, our mandates, how we can be, how we can complement our work in order to help the, the, the workers. 
One uh, something that it's very difficult is this question of emergency evacuation of workers. Last year uh, in BC, we faced uh, three climate issues that were uh, very important. The question of floodings, the heat dome, and also the fires. And many of the fires that are uh, having place right now that are in the north, near there, there are a lot of farmers, a lot of farms where Mexicans are working. So that's why we cooperate uh, a lot with the authorities. I can all, also tell you that in the last uh, at least uh, four or five years, every year, Mexican firefighters, uh, last year it was 103 firefighters, they came to help the authorities of, of BC to control the fires. No, so it's different kinds of collaboration and cooperation that we have with the government of BC. And in this case, it's also to take care of our workers. But it's, for example, I don't have access to, uh, to a helicopter or uh, ambulances. So that's, that's why it's very important to keep the coordination with the authorities at all times. Also, uh, uh, after the visits that we have made to the farms, normally how the, the, the consulate work is we make a written report, we send it to the employers with copy to all authorities involved, and we normally tell them what they need to change or, or, or what is happening that needs to be uh, fixed. For example, the bullying, harassment, normally the housing or the conditions that they are clean and healthy for the workers. And we give them a reasonable time, uh, sometimes two to three weeks a month, depending on the problem uh, to change those issues. If after that period, the, the farm does not make the changes, we make a second report. And if it's uh, something really uh, violating of the law, we act immediately. And at the end uh, of the year, we make an evaluation and I have retired and I have been uh, quite criticized for that by employers because I have not endorsed many farms that are not complying with the rights of my workers. So this, as you can imagine, can become a very tough issue also with the authorities here in Canada, because normally uh, the, the employers uh, have relationships with, with MPs and other people, and they obviously try to force me to endorse a farm, but uh, I have been very firm. And uh, in the time that I have been, I have not endorsed at least 16 or 70 17 important farms, and I have take them, uh, move them out of the, pro the program. Uh, Hugo has, has talked also about the migrant uh, worker support, support network. It's very important. It, it has helped us a lot. Uh, and well, the COVID crisis management, it was a very tough and difficult uh, moment for the consulate. At that time, Hugo was still working here with me. And well, the first thing that we had to deal with was to change all, all protocols to be able to bring the workers here, here to, to British Columbia. It was a very difficult situation because no, at that point, and it was uh, at the beginning when, when the pandemic was declared official here in BC, it was very difficult to know and understand what, were, uh, what was happening with COVID, what really COVID was. At that moment, uh, unfortunately, we had uh, 20 workers that go COVID in a farm that is in Kelowna. It's a nursery. And well, it was the, the important situation of that, of, of, uh, that contagious was that authorities and consulates, we sit down to understand what we need to do in order to be able to bring our workers. So nobody, uh, thankfully, all the workers uh, overcome COVID, but that was a, the, this case gave us the opportunity before all workers were, were coming to Canada to change the protocols and to, to understand what we needed to do. As you know, uh, the government of Canada declared uh, agricultural seasonal workers as essential workers. And that I think it's very important because I, as I always tell people, when you sit down to take your food, just everything that is on, on your plate was processed or made by temporary foreign workers. So we need really to understand the, the term of essential workers, what does it uh, mean and comprises. I, 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 as I tell you, uh, I, we, can ha we have cases here 
uh, as diverse as the number of people that we have uh, participating in the in the in the program. No, and uh, well, the context is among 5,000 workers coming every year to BC, many issues of all sorts pop up every day, literally. Thousands of life stories, and I'm going to give you some examples. No, for example, one good example, Jose has worked for the same farm for 10 years. Despite suffering from a non-work-related degenerative disease, his employer keeps on bringing him to Canada every year. He now performs lighter duties. There, here there was a, a typo mistake, but uh, other good things that come out from the participation of our workers is uh, we often learn of uh, very moving stories, for example, people from remote rural communities that in the, they didn't have the opportunity of have, having education in Mexico. Now they are sending their kids and they are very proud because their kids, they have with, with the money that they receive here, they have been able to pay their education in Mexico and they have become doctors, engineers, and in different areas, all of them having a, a universal, a, a, uni a title from a university. No, and that is due to the lifelong effort that temporary workers do uh, I have talked with other workers, for example, that have come here uh, for more than 18 years, no? And sometimes uh, employers tell me, consul, I want the people that came last year. Sometimes it's not easy because we need to, to see how long they need the workers because one uh, aspect of the program that has been very, com uh, is very complicated for us is when, when the crops are over and we need to transfer those workers to other farms. No, and there is not any, there's, we have not a system in place to send a, a letter to all farmers to let them know that we have uh, people, if you need people, we can send it to you. So that has to be done on a case by case basis. And we normally do it on the phone with, uh, with employers. The ugly, as uh, we have referred, no, I think there are still employers whose conduct of abuse, disrespect, and contract breaches is unworthy of Canadian values. No, I invite you to read uh, recently the Forensic of Ontario. They issue a document that was an evaluation of how the, the government and the agencies did in the pandemic regarding housing and many things related to temporary workers. And it's not the government of Mexico that is saying that uh, people do not, uh, that employers are disrespectful. You can read that report and you, you will get a, a, a broad picture of the things that workers, work, uh, temporary workers face. And those are the things that we are trying to address from the consulate. One, for example, a very ugly uh, example that I can give you, we had, a, and that I mentioned it already, uh, there was a, a, a Mexican worker that had, uh, he, he got COVID coming here to Canada. He had previous uh, problems in his health. So he had to be in the hospital for two months. After two months, obviously he was tired. He wanted to go back to Mexico. We spoke with him. He gave us the authorization to, uh, obviously since he was still a, um, he, the, the, the COVID was over, but he, st he still had other health issues. With the COAN uh, insurance that they have, we have the possibility to fly back our workers in, uh, ambu in, in ambulances, no? in, in, in planes. And with the, we did all the arrangements that it took us more than three weeks to make all the arrangements to send him back to Mexico, because obviously, you need to coordinate here, you need to coordinate in Mexico with the hospitals. And uh, uh, this man lived in, in, in Nayarit, so it's not that you, we have a direct flight there. So the plane had to do some stops, but finally he was received in, the, in, in a hospital. That's a good part of the story. The ugly was that at that point, and I will talk later a little bit more about uh, the, the role of NGOs and how they can really help the workers. No, uh, there was an NGO that uh, decided that without any kind of medical information that the worker shouldn't be sent back to Mexi Mexico, even though that was his will. And this uh, NGO sent the person to the ho uh, hospital and he attached to the bed of the, 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 the temporary worker and didn't want us to take the worker away. 
his argument was that the government of Canada should take care of that worker. And I said, well, these are not the conditions that, that we have here in Canada. If you have something or you, want, or you want the authorities to change something, talk to them. But we cannot put in risk the health and the life of my worker. But it was quite difficult. We started the discussion at 11 o'clock at night. The worker was going to be picked up at 5 o'clock in the morning and taken to the airport in an ambulance. And I think that uh, even I'm, I'm also a, a, a human rights activist, but we need to understand that we cannot use our workers or some cases in order to make our point or our case in front of the authorities. We, we need to be aware that we need really to respect the life and health of our workers. And I, well, I could stay here for many hours with you to talk about the ugly things, but I, I prefer to focus right now in how to collaborate and in positive efforts. So what uh, does we see as the, as the main challenges? Well, everybody, we know that a crisis, migration is going to exist always. No, uh, it will continue. And I think that uh, Mexico, Canada, and the US as partners of the CUSMA, we should consider mobility programs for different sectors. I have been reached out by different sectors, hospitality, construction, it's a reality that Canada, and at, at least in this case, British Columbia, they need additional people if they want to keep up with their economy. There's a study that from here to 2024, Canada uh, and British Columbia will need a million workers to come if they want to keep their, their economy going. And one third of that people that they need uh, are temporary workers. So we need to... Uh, to, to to give them the conditions uh, to come. Because for example, in the case of agriculture, employers have to provide the housing. But sometimes as I tell, when they told me about uh, bringing workers to other areas, I tell them the problem is that BC doesn't have enough housing. We can read that on the newspapers that, that there's a lack of ad uh, adequate housing, not enough, that prices are going high that rents uh, are 30% over uh, if we compare them to last year. So the conditions in the ground have to be met in order for us to be able to bring our, our workers. Also, we, we need to continue uh, making a, a, an analysis and uh, authorities, and the good news is that uh, MP Carla Cualtro, that she's from the Delta, She's doing an exercise in order to make adjustments more and to try to be more flexible, you know, as it has been done in other programs, in also in the case of agriculture, without losing benefits or the advantages that workers already have in the contract that they sign every year. As a result of lessons learned during the pandemics, we need to enhance the measures and procedures, especially regarding housing and health that are urgently needed. British Columbia was the only province that gave accommodation in hotels to our workers, and that was a way to avoid mass, massive contagious as happened in other provinces. And here, I think the main point that we have been raising and that we really need that uh, NGOs or unions or everybody help us with the authorities is the question of the inspections. This, if, if inspections are done, Previously, before workers arrived to Canada, I can assure you that that would help us solve at least 80% of many of the problems that we face. But uh, we need to insist much more that, that inspections should be done, that there is a need, as um, uh, Hugo mentioned, there are different agencies and ministries involved. So they need to give a training to people that can cover the different aspects that need to be reviewed and go to the farms in a, in, a, in a permanent basis. Or if they go before workers arrive and they see that the employers are not meeting the conditions, don't send the workers there. And also uh, in my talks with BCAP, what I normally tell them is that they, uh, should not have as members of their associations workers that do not comply. That doesn't makes a, it doesn't give a, a, a positive opinion of the different associations if they are covering employers that we know that are not complying with the laws and with the program. 
Canadian authorities at all levels must play a more decisive role in ensuring the supervision and enforcement of labor and human rights regulation. No, as I tell you, uh, there needs to be much more consideration, uh, coordination between the federal and the provincial levels. Also, uh, bad farmers need to be sanctioned. There are sanctions that are in the Canadian laws and the, the law should be applied to the, these people that are not committed. Also, uh, the question of the taxes, as I was telling you, it's very difficult for the workers, first, because of the language, second, because sometimes they are already back in Mexico when, uh, when they need to, uh, to present their, their ta the, to fulfill their taxes. So it's very difficult for them because of the language or the situation. So we have given some uh, recommendations to the government, for example, that uh, in Canada Revenue Agency, there should be a people that could talk Spanish. It's not a big change, but if they have something, um, if they can, they can, they can help. Is there are translators in many to many languages? The area of taxes it's a very important one, and and our 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 uh, Mexicans should benefit of all the resources that are given by the by the Canadian government. So uh, they tell me I have two more minutes left. Uh, also, Canada has signed international instruments, so they are uh, they should uh, commit with those instruments. And well, beyond the formal recognition of rights, we need to identify and mitigate the true source of unfairness and inequality that are the lack of effective access to exercising such rights due to barriers of language, culture, and resources. And also consulates have a specific mandate of protection for cases in which life or security of a person is in danger. We don't provide services. Those services need to be provided either by the employers, the government or NGOs. And we can help Canadian authorities efforts, but we can never replace them. That is why the alliance with NGOs, NGOs with a lot of human and financial resources is so important. And well, Hugh has given you the, the examples of the window of services that I, they are supporting here in the, in the Consulate of Mexico, because we think that's a way to help our workers. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm here for your, for your Q&A. Great. Thank you, Bernice. Um, we'd like to invite Hugo back as well. <clears throat> Great. So we'll begin with our questions. Um, so there's a lot of information shared uh, from both of you, and there's some very specific questions and some broader questions. I'll try to stick to the broader questions. Um, Hugo, you mentioned in your presentation about the Coalition of Consulates Alliance, um, and folks were wondering how they can be a part of that or support that. Well, it's uh, basically uh, uh, the consular alliance is made from uh, coordinated by Mexico, so they would have to reach out to the consul general, but it includes Mexico, Guatemala, Jamaica, Caribbean countries, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, who are, uh, Solomon Islands. So those kind of, uh, if you have any issue with those countries or nationals in those positions, which you, you would like uh, to be addressed, you can always reach out to, to the Consul General of Mexico and then the communication will, will go from there. Yes, I, I, it's comprised of, of countries, no, the alliance, but uh, the thing that we're doing as we do it, as this presentation is doing, we also give you access to some of the NGOs and the people that really work for the, for the, for the workers. We make presentations in the consular alliance. No, so if, if, if there is anybody that is participating that would like to make a presentation to the consular, consular alliance, no, but we normally keep it not to persons individually, but to NGOs that their mandate is related to temporary workers. So uh, please call my office and I will be very happy to discuss the, the possibility of having an encounter with the, the Consular Alliance. Great, thank you. Um, and this is for both, both of you. Um, can you share information or resources about contract rules, TFW rights and obligations, housing standards, and about who does what regarding the organizations and ministers that do support migrant workers? 
So when we do identify issues um, with TFWs and their employers, for example, we know what to do and to be more effective in supporting them and working together. So is, is there resources? Yeah, I would say uh, two basic documents. One is the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program contract. You can find that in the Service Canada uh, website. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Yes. Also, the rules for the AgStream uh, program are also there. And low-skilled workers, which are the bulk of the migrant workers. Um, I would say that's basically, um, if they want a directory of the agencies involved, they can uh, always reach me in my in my. Uh, email and I can give you a directory of the agencies that are involved, the 22 that work with us. That doesn't uh, mean all of them in BC. And uh, do they have to report to the consulate? I would say yes, if there's an accident, because the consulate is the one that coordinates the health, uh, if not, not in charge of the health issues, but uh, the insurance and can uh, follow up. Okay, great. Yes, individual cases, please reach out to the consulate. We have an emergency line. No, so if you if there is any worker in need and his life is in danger, his life or health, those are the cases that we attend directly and we need to, to move uh, very quickly. And also, uh, besides the documents uh, that Hugo mentioned, and I will uh, send them to you, Bahar, they, uh, I think it's very important to read the forensic report that was recently presented by the authorities here of Canada that make an evaluation. And also that uh, people need to be acquainted with the law that was adopted, uh, it, I think it was three years ago, that was the one that Hugo mentioned, that it gives a possibility and that's uh, very important to consulates to uh, share information with the government of BC in order to change things. But I will, will be sending you the, the, the links in order to that you could share with the group of participants. Great, thank you. Um, and this is a bit of a follow-up question. Who do, employ, who do employers notify or must they notify um, if a worker has an emergency and needs to return to his home country? directly to the consulate, no? Every, all the emergencies and uh, workers have that possibility, no? Obviously, and we have had cases where a family has passed away, no? The, the employers need to, to pay the, the way back to the worker because that's part of the contract, but they have been flexible enough that when uh, workers need to go back to Mexico, they let us know. They buy the ticket, we coordinate with the people of the uh, agency, the tourist agency, and we help them go back to, the, to Mexico. Great. And um, Berenice, you covered a lot about the contracts of the employers and the employees. Um, are TFWs provided with a copy of their contract? Yes. We do a lot of things in, uh, with, the, with the workers. And I can tell you, they have the contract because they sign it, they have their copy, it's in their language. And also uh, the consulate, we have been trying to strengthen the, the preventive measures. And what I mean by preventive measures, we have elaborated here in the consulate, a small document that is given to the workers when they arrive. So they know what the rights are in a very uh, simple way of saying, but it's a, a short document that we give the worker that includes the, the emergency line of the consulate. And we have been reproducing these kinds of, of exercises through media, through Facebook, all the channels that we know that uh, workers use. And right now uh, I am developing with Mexico, in Mexico, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we are developing a specific app that is going to be given to the workers so they can be directly in contact. No, for example, if there's a need to let the workers know anything about fires, with that application, we will be able to send them inf direct information without having to go to, through other different channels. But we are uh, reinforcing and all, also sending documents to Mexico so they can read before coming here, not just the document that we give them in the, in the airport. Okay, great. Um, 
And a follow-up question to, the, to that, as someone just mentioned in the chat, with Guatemalan clients I've had, the contract they receive in their country has been in English and it is not explained to them in Spanish. But in Mexico, the contracts are translated to Spanish for each worker. Um, I know that Hugo, you also work with the Guatemalan customers. Yes, uh, but you can, uh, they're usually in the three languages and I put a, a link right there. You can play, a, a, a go inside the government of Canada and they usually have them in uh, English, Spanish and French. So okay. if they don't have it and Guatemala don't, don't do seasonal agriculture, they do ag stream. So the ag stream contract is there. Oh, okay, great, that's really helpful. Great. Um, we have another comment that says, um, for it's directed for Bernice. It is so valuable that you go visit the farms with the migrant workers. Super important work. Is there a master list of farms that are not endorsed so that we are not duplicating efforts with non-compliant employers? Is there a connection with Employment Standards Board, Workers' Com Compensation Board? Yes, uh, uh, one of these exercises of coordination no, that I started with Hugo was exactly that. No, We noticed that there are different agencies that need to be involved. And for the first time, it was the Consulate General of Mexico that we make joint visits to the farms with agencies. No, So they can see by the, the, the rights no, that it's not only the Consul General of Mexico. And believe me, my people are, are very professional and very trained. And the reports that we do when we go to each farm are directly linked to which part of the contract they are violating. No, So it's not only that I arrived, I look around and I criticize, no. We go by the contract, check each of the aspects that is in the contract, each of the articles. And when we make the reports, we do them uh, relating them to, uh, directly to the contract. So there cannot be any kind of subjectivity. No? Uh, and as I tell you, we normally uh, copy all of those um, complaints to, to the, at the federal and at the provincial level. So authorities know where the problems are. That, I tell you, that my mandate is until there because I cannot oblige farmers to comply or apply the Canadian law. That's for the authorities, not for the government of Mexico. I'm a, I'm a foreign entity, so I do have my limitations. And uh, well, at least in my case, yes, I have a list of, of the, the farms I have not endorsed. I have shared that information also with the, with the government of BC. But I need to respect the privacy laws. That's why I don't uh, mention the name of any farm, because I'm obliged to uh, privacy laws here in Canada. But authorities know who they are. Right. And I think that's an important point about your limitations as well, um, that we should probably emphasize. You know, there's only so many things you can do, right? Um, OK. So the next question is, what sort of safeguarding mechanisms do you have to allow workers to safely lodge their complaints without fear of victimization? Well, uh, I can tell you, they, they, can, they don't have to have any fear. The fear is not with the consulate. Sometimes the workers are afraid of, and we have had, uh, believe me, many cases, some, there was a, a a, a very serious case of, of uh, sexual abuse and laboral abuse, no? And uh, we spoke with the, with the workers, no? In that farm, there were uh, also Guatemalans and Mexicans, no? We talked to all of them, we gave them the, the assurances that nothing bad was going to happen neither to them nor their families. And I tell you that it was a group of maybe 20 workers and only two decided to present the complaint to the authorities of Canada. No? So we also need to, to make our workers more aware that there are, there are forms that they can present their cases, that they are not going to be sent back to Mexico, but that they need to speak up. No, and also if uh, we can transfer those workers or, and we can keep the conf confidentiality of those workers, but they need to speak up. 
And uh, from the point of view of the consulate, they can talk to us, we talk to the employers, we send a letter in writing, a report to them, telling them that we are aware of a situation or we spoke with them on the telephone. And something that also workers, uh, I will share with everybody. So when they go back to Mexico, no, as the, employee, the, the employer does a report of the worker, but the worker can also do a report of the employer. So they should also try to use it if they didn't present the case to the authorities or to the consulate because it was not an urgent matter. They can present that report or those concerns directly to the national system of employment that is the one responsible for this program in Mexico or to the consulate. No, and we normally take uh, care of that and resolve those cases. Thank you. Um, we have one other question. It's 1232, so I'm, I want to be conscious of everyone's time. Um, so I'll, take, I'll probably do two more questions and then we will end the webinar. Um, is there currently a delay for granting TFW's immediate access to MSP? And if yes, what are the barriers right now that have been identified? Uh, yes, I think there is a barrier and it's significant and we should all advocate together for this because the contract of the MSP says that you have to be at least three months in the province to acquire it. And then the same contract says that you have to live here at least six months to keep it. So this is not the situation with every single uh, temporary foreign worker. But if they were declared essential by the prime minister, we believe that they should have MSP upon arrival and be covered. Or else they usually have other uh, private insurances because LMIA contract says they should have a, a private insurance while they get MSP. But sometimes the employers do not give them this. And also there's the language barrier. So a worker that wants to go to the hospital or to a clinic, usually has to put his own money and then get reimbursed from that private insurance, which wouldn't happen if they had MSP. This would give them more liberty regarding their health and it, it's a right they should have uh, while they're uh, from the airport to their farm. And also if a government of Canada accepts, the approves the LMI, no, at the same moment they should uh, be uh, pro processing the possibility that they can give, be given the MSP when, when workers arrive. We, we see it feasible. It's not something that, that is impossible to do. Okay, great. Um, we've had a number of comments around how do we connect with you? How do we better collaborate with you, with you both? Um, so if you could please share your contact information in the chat box, then folks can access that right away. We will also send that out um, in a follow-up email uh, anyway, but in the meantime, while everyone is super engaged, it would be great to, if you could post that information. Um, and then we also had a comment in the- Hugo, uh, puedes poner el de, can you put the uh, uh, petat? The one yeah, of the sure, top, please? sure, of course. Okay. And then we had a comment, uh, sorry, a question around um, TFWs becoming permanent residents of Canada and if we can bring their family with them under the temporary program. And actually that one, we have a webinar coming up August 24th that specifically um, is around temporary residents to permanent residents. And we'll give you the login information and the re registration information for that shortly. Um, so I think I will end our Q&A session there. But um, if your question was more specific and perhaps did not get um, answered today, then you can contact um, the uh, Mexican consulate or Hugo, um, who's also in touch with other consulates. Um, I think Hugo and their team at Mosaic have been doing a great job of uh, collaborating with consulates, um, at least in British Columbia. Um, yeah, so thank you both for joining us today and all of the information. I know it's a short amount of time to fit in so much valuable info for our audience. Um, I would also like to thank the AMSA team, Ms. Rock, Nima, and Boyd, who have been working hard in the background to compile all of your questions and make sure nothing's missed and the tech is working. So thank you to our team. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email, as I mentioned, 
uh, with an evaluation survey for this session. So if uh, our audience could please take five minutes to complete the evaluation form because your feedback is very important to us and it helps us improve uh, future sessions like this one. And next slide, if you're interested in attending any of our upcoming events, or if you would like to get more information or access to a particular resource, there's a few ways you can connect with us. You can visit the Migrant Worker Hub website where you can access different resources as well as sign up for our newsletter where we share our latest resources, online and in-person event invites, um, info sheets, and a lot of, just a lot of information is constantly being added and it's free for everyone to sign up. You can also follow us on social media on Twitter and Facebook um, and LinkedIn and all that information is on the slide. And lastly, feel free to email our team at any time, uh, migrantworkerhub at amsa.org. And again, we would like to thank the Government of Canada's Temporary Foreign Worker Program for funding this event today. And thank you all. Again, thank you to Hugo, to Veronese, um, and thank you for attending our session today, The Role of Foreign Consulates in Protecting Migrant Workers. And have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.